Today's top story from the perspective of someone who's there. You are looking live. This just in. Not my beat. Now, Kevin Sheehan has been here, so to speak, uh, his whole life in D.C. as a commander's burgundy and gold of all of varieties and names fan. And thus, Kevin, we thought you, uh, as, as you are kindly called uh, Professor Sheehan often by, by the good doctor, Doc Walker, are the perfect person to uh, go, down, go down the history lesson with. Are you ready to put your prof- professorial hat on for us? Oh, yeah. Um, I mean, do I... Did I qualify for that level? I mean, actually, Smoot calls me professor. I didn't know Doc called me professor. I, too, I feel like I have. I mean, I know Doc quite, calls you Coach Sheehan. It's quite an honor to be called, you know, whatever, uh, any any name by these guys. But go ahead. What, what's up? Yeah, so Anthony had a good question the other day. He's like, is this the most important draft in franchise history? Which, for a franchise that's 100 years old almost, is a pretty large question. But when you think of like the most important drafts in the history of the Burgundy and Gold, what are the the years that come to mind, and how would you even go about like framing that question? Because I feel like sometimes it's even hard to tell in real time. Although this one with the number two pick, the new everything, feels like we know ahead of time. It's pretty important. Yeah, I think this is it, Craig. I mean, you know, I'm just trying to think. Um, you know, any year that they've had a top level pick with a need of quarterback coming off bad seasons were probably really important 2012 obviously comes to mind yep um 2020 uh, 2019 comes to mind although they didn't have the number two pick in that draft no this one feels look from a business standpoint they still don't have everybody back on board you know those games last year The tickets sold were still primarily to the opponent's fan base after the opener against Arizona. Um, They still have people wondering what this new group will be about. It's great not to have Dan here. That's a step in the right direction. You know, there's a lot of complexity to, to other things surrounding this franchise. Winning has to happen, you know, for every, for the largest percentage of people that are out there on the fence on whether or not they're going to jump back in or not winning's big and getting number two right will go a long way towards you know deciding whether or not they win any time in the near future so that feels big and then the fact that they've got six picks in the top 100 as they're trying to remake the roster there's a huge opportunity if they hit on say the majority of those or even half of those to make a big difference. This one feels like the most important one, even in my lifetime of, you know, rooting for this team, the North Turner year um, when they were awful in 93 uh, with Richie Pettibone, two years removed from winning the Super Bowl, that felt really big because it was kind of a regime change. Charlie was still here, but they, we're going to pick a quarterback who is either going to be Heath Schuler or Trent Dilfer. They got it wrong, and they were not very good for many years. Um, but this one feels really big. It does. And I think when you have number two and you're going to take a quarterback, it, it obviously jumps very high on the list. Um, Definitely. Ant, Ant didn't, just, uh, didn't just ask the question. He did some research. So here's some of the nominees, and I'm curious your reflections of these. Um, you know, obviously at the time and then uh, in hindsight, unfortunately for most of them, or I guess for two of the three that, that he lists out here, uh, how quickly you realize it had gone horribly wrong. 2012 is, is RG3. That's obvious. And it looked like it went as right as it could go in year one. And then, and then we all know it goes sideways. In 2000, they had picks two and three that year, and it was the first yeah, full off season where Dan Snyder was in control of the team. And, and of course, that's the Fortune 500 year, if you will, spend a fortune, go 500. And then on the good side, uh, 1981, Bobby Bethard, uh, in the first full off season of Joe Gibbs, drafts Mark May, Russ Grimm, Dexter Manley, Charlie Brown, Daryl uh, Grant, uh, amongst others, also assigned this uh, this undrafted free agent named Joe Jacoby, who turned out to be all right. So that that one obviously goes down in the good column. But it, what what strong reflections do you have on any of those three that obviously fit this well, bill? The, of very the, important. The eighty one draft is the greatest draft in franchise history. Clint Diddy Clint Didier was was yep. drafted in the twelfth round, the final round, which was it was a twelve round draft, I think, back then. Um, and you mentioned Jacoby signed as a free agent, and that you know that set what turned out to be um 
you know, sort of the foundation for what they would become, you know, the Hogs with Grim, May, and Jacoby all acquired in the offseason. Uh, and that that was, they, I mean, Bobby Beathard hit on just about everything. And Bobby Beathard, by the way, it was unusual for them to have a first-round pick because George Allen had essentially traded most of their first-round picks away, and even Beathard moved on from some first-rounders. The year before 81 was the first first-round pick I think they had had in maybe a decade when they selected Art Monk. But the 2000 offseason, um, in terms of free agency, was really what set this franchise back more than the drafted because LeVar, look, LeVar was a really good player. He just couldn't stay healthy. Um, and Chris Samuels is, you know, up there among the, and he's on the short list of the greatest left tackles in franchise history. Um, 2012, I mean, yeah, I mean, it's, it's the RG3 draft. Uh, I was okay with what they did. I was perfectly fine, and I was trusting in Mike Shanahan that they had made that big trade with the Rams. They needed a quarterback desperately. It was Grossman. It was Beck. Um, you know, neither one of those two guys were guys that Mike thought he could win big with. He waited for the opportunity. Obviously, it would have been better to have number one overall and pick luck. Um, but I was okay with what they did with Robert. And I was also okay with them drafting Cousins in the fourth round because, you know, there was a lot that was unknown about RG3, and you needed two anyway. And we had seen examples previously. I mean, Washington had drafted Schuler. And then they drafted Gus Farratt in the seventh round, and it turned out that Farratt had the much longer career. But, yeah, 2012 was big, for sure. They didn't get much right other than Alfred Morris after that, if my memory serves me correctly. Well, they didn't have a lot of picks, obviously, too, because there was – I mean, there was the three first for Robert, yeah. but I think some other – They had late-round picks, yeah. yeah. Um, and, I, I mean, shoot, they got cousins, right? Um, just yeah. – and messed it up later. Uh, Kevin Sheehan's with us here on the Hoffman Show, taking a bit of a trip down memory lane in Washington draft history. Um, that said, you know, when we look at this current one, I, I actually got asked a similar question – kind of how important is it to nail number two when I was taping something earlier today for, for TV with Natalie uh, over at ABC7. And I was like, my my inclination is they got to get it right because it's number two and it's quarterback. But then again, Adam Peters last time drafting a quarterback high was Trey Lance, and he messed that up uh, along with, with everyone else in San Francisco, and it worked out just fine. They played in multiple Super Bowls, and then they accidentally drafted the franchise quarterback as Mr. Irrelevant. So I, I guess I'll, I'll ask you the same question and let you take it wherever you want, Kevin, but like how, how right do they need to get number two, and if they, they miss here, considering it's a natural pick, unlike RG, where they trade up and give a bunch of capital away, like how far does it set you back if they don't get this right? Well, obviously getting it right is much better than getting it wrong, but you yes. have to have, as, ben, uh, as Bill Barnwell wrote last week, you've got to have a healthy expectation. You, you don't fear taking the quarterback at number two. It's the right thing to do if there's a quarterback there that you think can do it, um, especially given that you don't have one. And, you know, Barnwell went into all of the things that we all as NFL fans have talked about, which is, the way the game's played today and how it's tilted towards offensive football and tilted towards quarterback performance. And you've got a rookie wage scale since 2011. So financially, in terms of the risk, it's a hundred percent the right thing to do if you have a need and you like somebody, but you have to have that healthy expectation that more likely than not, you won't get it right. I mean, it's insane to think that way, that it's the right thing to do to pick the quarterback there that you believe in the most but more likely than not, history says you won't get what you hope you're getting. Um, so I don't know. You got to take the quarterback. You got to take the one that you really like and is the highest one in your board. Um, and you hopefully have the staff, the organizational support, you know, eventually putting a team around that quarterback Hopefully the fit is right and the quarterback is right. Sometimes, Craig, the quarterback isn't the only part of the problem. It's the organization that he goes to. It's the staff. It's what they do to support that quarterback. It's the system. Um, a lot of things have to come together for it to work, but it's the right thing to do to take the quarterback there. Yeah, without question. And, and that dichotomy is really hard, I think, for some people to swallow of like, you know, people will say, oh, well, 
a, the history of failing at number two is, or not at number one or outside this or whatever is so high. And I'm like, okay, well, what's your plan? And it's like, well, I'm like, you tell me what works better. We can do that. But there, there isn't a good answer to that. So, so you just go and do it, which then leads to this question. How confident are you in Washington's current setup to, to not get it right, but make it right? Those are two different things, right? Um, because you're talking about Adam Peters versus what this quarterback would be walking into in the locker room well, with the coach, the I, offensive coordinator, et cetera. I mean, kind of, but I, what I would I would kind of say is, like, I don't know that anybody is the right pick for the Patriots because they're so barren infrastructure-wise where I think multiple people, multiple prospects could be the right guy here. Like, I could see any of the three, Daniels, uh, McCarthy, or May, succeeding here because I feel like this staff can make it right versus, you know, because even if, you know, Jaden goes somewhere else and is successful or fails, doesn't mean he would have necessarily had the same career here, if you get what I'm saying. Yeah, I mean, what I'm saying is, you know, I don't know. Maybe Alex Van Pelt will be a savior in New England. And maybe Cliff maybe. Kingsbury really is cut out to be a college coach. And, you know, these are things that I'm not completely confident in. But obviously, I feel better about this situation than last than two years ago at this time um, or the last time they took a quarterback high. Um, yeah, they they've been able to with Dan Quinn I think being the impetus for this more than even Adam Peters or Josh Harris they've been able to attract a very impressive group of people that have come in here with lots of experience and lots of experience experiences um, and I do feel that any I feel like certainly McCar- Daniels and, and May would be the two other than Williams that I would feel like it should be a good fit here, but we're not going to know until we actually see it. But yeah, it's a lot better than it's been. That's for sure. So you're, you don't put McCarthy in, in your list there. No, why I not? Don't. I, um, a couple of reasons. Number one, isn't fair to him. I just haven't seen enough of it. Uh, like I've seen with Daniels with, I've like I've seen with May and Kayla Williams. Number two is what I have seen, I think is good. I think it's solid. And I think some of the comps that people have made, like, hey, he plays like Kirk Cousins. He'd be perfect in this Shanahan scheme. That's great. I would never, as much as I like Kirk Cousins, I would never spend number two overall on him. So uh, what I've seen from Daniels and what I've seen even from Penix Jr. and May are more impressive to me than what I've seen with McCarthy. But again, like I've been caveating all of this with we we don't know so much, you know, about these guys. We don't know what they're planning. We don't know about them as people. I mean, the intangibles, they all said once they got a load of McCarthy in an interview room, the intangibles would jump off the charts. And apparently that has happened. But it's just preference. I, I like Williams, Daniels. And then after that, I think the next level for me would be Penix Jr. followed by May and McCarthy. Interesting, interesting. Uh, I think that's one of the things that for me has clarified slash become a giant question uh, that I always am curious about with different evaluators and something I kind of want to study more is how much of it is about what you do see versus how much of what you don't. Um, Like how much are you willing to project certain traits versus saying, okay, I haven't seen that but or I haven't seen enough of it, but I think he can do it. Like, and, and that's where this becomes much more art than science, um, even if, if you even want to call it art. I don't even know that it's art. It's just uh, it feels like a wild goose chase in a guessing game sometimes because we all have the same tape and whatever, but how to weigh certain traits, certain characteristics, and, and certain things is all, you know, it's all dealer's choice at that point. Yeah, and I think, like, uh, I could see why people who actually do this for a living, true evaluators, could project J.J. McCarthy to, to be able to do those things at an NFL level. Uh, but personally, I just think Jaden Daniels and Caleb Williams will end up doing it at a much higher level. Um, I think both things can be true. McCarthy, it's not that I, because I didn't see it, Um, or maybe others didn't see it, that it can't be that. I just think that Daniels and Caleb Williams are a notch above everybody else, at least. 
Kevin Sheehan with us here on the Hoffman Show. Uh, wrapping up, not talking about the number two pick. Do you have strong feelings about trading back into the back end of the first round, your willingness to do that versus staying at 36 and 40 and seeing how the board falls? Yeah, I mean, I'm fine with that. I think they've got so much availability dry powder wise in terms of picks. I mean, this is the perfect opportunity. If there's somebody that's much higher on their board, you know, at say 27 or 26, then they know they're going to have at 36. I don't have a problem with that at all. You know, and I, I think it's even possible with left tackles, pass rushers, I don't know about receivers jumping back into the first round, but it's very possible that they want to come out of this draft with a guy that they feel like they can plug in very soon at left tackle, and that guy might not be there at 36, but he might be there at 26, and I'd be okay with that. Yeah, that's what happened. We did our uh, our mock draft 1.0 on the show here yesterday. Wound up trading back up for Marius Mims, Tyler Guyton, another name to watch uh, in that yep. that realm as well. Uh, Kevin Sheehan, of course, 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. daily here on the Team 980. You can also check out the Kevin Sheehan Show podcast. Kevin, always appreciate your time, sir. Uh, you can take your professorial spectacles off and uh, relax for the rest of the day watching the Masters because I'm, I'm weeks, sure you already are. Greg, two weeks, that's all we have. I know. I oh, I know. Here fast enough. I'll be sitting in in Detroit somewhere in two weeks, so that'll be right, that'll be good. a good well, time. I'll talk to you the day of. Hopefully. All right. Yep. Definitely. All Sounds right. good. All right. Thanks, Kevin. That is Kevin Sheehan right. with us here on the Hoffman Show. Uh, speaking of the Masters, we got an update for you in just a few minutes from Westwood One and Ted Emmerich. Uh, Tiger Woods on the course. Some of the big names at the top of the leaderboard down in Augusta. Uh, but coming up at 5.30 on a Thursday, you know what time it is. It is time for Never Read the Comments. This is the Hoffman Show on the Team 980 and the Odyssey app.